I think many people are aware that if you have snoring and obstructive sleep apnea, this tends to lead to high blood pressure. And if you look at the research data, you'll see that as your sleep apnea gets worse, your blood pressure slowly gets worse with it. The problem is, however, that some people come into clinic and say, look, I've got sort of bad sleep apnea. You check their blood pressure and it seems entirely normal. And you think, oh, how can that be? That doesn't make any sense. And exactly the same sort of person with the same level of sleep apnea can come into your office and say, uh, my blood pressure is terrible. I'm on three separate antihypertensives. I've got something known as resistant hypertension. Why is this happening to him and not to him? And so there's that weird sort of, it seems to be really bad in some people and not so bad in other people. And then also you'd think that, okay, the main treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is CPAP. You'd think that CPAP would really help these people with high blood pressure because it should just bring everything back down again, but it doesn't always work like that. And sometimes CPAP can make blood pressure worse. So my name's Vic Veer. I'm an ENT consultant surgeon working for the NHS in central London. And today I'm going to try and explain this really weird, confusing, conflicting information when it comes to obstructive sleep apnea and blood pressure. Now, a lot of people will say, well, obstructive sleep apnea and high blood pressure have got the same risk factors. That's why they're, you know, they're both are overweight and that's what drives both of these problems. And if you've been watching this channel long enough, you'll know that that's one of my pet peeves. Um, obstructive sleep apnea is not caused by um, uh, weight gain at all. It, it can make sleep apnea worse, but what generally happens is that you get the obstructive sleep apnea first and obstructive sleep apnea itself causes weight gain. So it's not a risk factor. So um, what actually happens is that obstructive sleep apnea is a risk factor for gaining weight. So that's really important, I think, to understand. The other thing to say, if you want to know more about that sleep apnea and weight gain thing, I've got a video here and you can have a look at that if you haven't seen that video before. But, but I think that obstructive sleep apnea raises your blood pressure by a different means altogether. And if you look at the, um, the literature evidence on this, it, it is quite complicated. You get... The way to think about it really is that obstructive sleep apnea occurs at night and it causes problems at night because people with obstructive sleep apnea have to battle through the night with their breathing. They're not resting and recuperating like normal people, they're having a lovely time and wake up refreshed in the morning. These people are battling through the night to get air in and out of their lungs, working really hard. And what happens is that occasionally your oxygen levels keep dropping down every hour, sometimes 15 to 30, sometimes 60, 100 times an hour this happens. And so your oxygen levels drop. That causes you to take a breath, a surge of catecholamines or adrenaline. I think the Americans call it epinephrine, epinephrine or something. But adrenaline surges through your system, pushes up your blood pressure, pushes up your pulse rate, your heart rate. And that makes you go, take a breath, and then you sink back into sleep again, the whole process starts again. Now, just before I move on, people with obstructive sleep apnea are blissfully unaware of all these events. No one wakes up 100 times an hour. They just sleep through it. So you're aroused or you, you're sort of partly woken up, but you, you have no inkling of this. You, you don't remember it actually happening. So, you know, over 80% of people have no idea that they have obstructive sleep apnea. The only way to check is do a sleep study. That's a different video, and I'm sure that you'll find it on one of my channels, or somewhere in my channel. But... Because of these drops in oxygen, the surge of catecholamines, the adrenaline going through your system, spikes in blood pressure and heart rate, these people have a, a change in their uh, blood pressure and uh, heart rate at night. So normal people, when they sleep, um, their blood pressure drops by at least 10%. So during the day, they're maybe 120 over 70, everything seems fine and dandy. And normal people, when they sleep, it drops by about 10% or more. But in obstructive sleep apnea patients, because they're fighting all night to get air in and out of their lungs and this release of catecholamines and all this sort of stuff, their blood pressure doesn't drop. So they go from a dipper, we call it in the medical literature. So they um, normal people are dippers. Their blood pressure drops at night and they become a non-dipper because actually the blood pressure doesn't drop at night because you get these surges of uh, high blood pressure, sometimes 240 over 130, something ridiculous. And that raises their blood pressure at night. And so they become a non-dipper. Their blood pressure during the day is almost the same as it is at night. Uh, and it sounds like, oh, that should be fine. But actually that makes a massive difference to your mean blood pressure throughout the day. So a lot of these charts which show you that your blood pressure goes up with your uh, as your um, sleep apnea gets worse, that's based on the mean blood pressure. 
And so that's why people who turn up to your clinic and say, oh, my blood pressure's fine. My doctor's checked it and everything's all right. But actually, if you check their blood pressure at night as well, you'll see that their mean blood pressure goes up and their blood pressure at night is either non-dipping or actually goes up at night. So they're risers rather than dippers or non-dippers. And alongside all of these uh, dipping and catecholamines going everywhere, the, the oxygen drops and the um, systemic inflammation you get from stretching these blood vessels all the time, in, all night and during the day, you get changes throughout the system. You get um, baroreflect, baroreflex, um, oh God, I can't even say it, baroreceptor reflex problems because it's constantly stretched. It doesn't close and open as it normally does. So the body sort of gets used to a higher blood pressure and it compounds on night after night and you get systemic inflammation. All of these set off a thing called the renin ACE aldosterone pathway, which pumps more fluid into your system to bring the blood pressure up a little bit more. And all these things get make your blood pressure slowly worse and worse. So it's like a natural progression from a person who's a dipper, their blood pressure drops at night, a non-dipper, a riser, their activation systems go up so there's more fluid in the system. That fluid in the system increases the blood flow and more fluid in your neck. So that blocks your breathing as well. So you get this sort of cyclical relationship. The more fluid you have in your neck and, and these areas, it, the more blood um, obstructive sleep pattern you have. And that's the thing that started in the first place. So it's going around in this horrible cycle, getting worse and worse. And because of this, so we've seen the people who, uh, oh, my blood pressure is fine. What are you talking about? But there are some people also who are further along this pathway who have, uh, they're on all sorts of medication, normally dealing with this, uh, the ACE aldosterone and the renin sort of pathway here. And they're not seem to work because there's something driving these pathways that normal people don't have a problem with. Uh, and all these drugs are trying to fix it, but it's not really doing very much. And, and also their blood pressure, even though they're on all these antihypertensives, seems to go up and down. It's very brittle, we would call it. And so cardiologists have an awful difficult time dealing with these people uh, and luckily cardiologists love doing research they can't they can't help themselves and uh I've forgotten the part uh, i think it's 2004 there's a paper by Cal calhoun or something who showed that if you have someone in front of you with very high resistant uh, hypertension on resistant means three antihypertensives that aren't helping then you should check those people for obstructive sleep apnea because uh, I think he said 90% of men had obstructive sleep apnea, these resistant hypertensives. 90% of men had obstructive sleep apnea, and I think 70 to 80% of women had obstructive sleep apnea. They, they were unknown to have it because, they're, as I said, they're blissfully unaware that they have obstructive sleep apnea until, oh, yeah, I've come to my hypertensive clinic and they can't work out what's wrong with me. They then do a sleep study, even though there's mm, my sleep's fine, I sleep all night. And then they're found to have obstructive sleep apnea. And then they're given treatment such as CPAP. And then hopefully everything just gets better again. Which brings me on to, I guess, the second half of this video, which is about why CPAP doesn't seem to be working as much in these people as you'd expect. Why does it increase the blood pressure in some people and decrease the blood pressure in other people? It doesn't make any sense. And the dirty, evil little cynic in me will think, well, the reason why is because all these trials use good CPAP users, uh, which means that they use CPAP for uh, four hours each night, 70% of the time. But if you think about that, that's 2.9 hours each night that they're using CPAP. And they're very pleased with themselves. Oh, look, I'm a good CPAP user. My AHI is 0 0.6 when it used to be 40 or something, which is good. But then you have to remember that for the other four and a bit hours each night, they're struggling to breathe, systemic inflammation, baroreceptor reflexes all over the place. The um, renin ACE aldosterone pathway has been pumped through. So no wonder they still have, they still um, go up in terms of becoming a non-dipper at night. So it doesn't seem to help their obstructive sleep apnea. Um, but that evil little cynic of me is probably not true because actually there's, there's layers of complexity on this and I'll go through these layers with you. So the first thing is that actually uh, if you do, if you are a good CPAP user and you've got really bad high blood pressure problems including uh, um, um, severe obstructive sleep apnea. Using CPAP does bring your blood pressure down and it works very well for those people. Um, I'll go into a little bit of complexity about that later. But if you're quite mild and, you don't, and, you're, a, and you're a dipper at night, you have normal blood pressure drops at night, then giving someone CPAP, particularly if you're very mild or um, if you're very mild or if it's not set very correctly, so it's pumping too much air into you, 
it's no wonder that your blood pressure does rise a little bit at night because it's this pressure which is going into your lungs, inflating your lungs a lot. That causes uh, what we would call a slight pulmonary hypertension. So the blood vessels in your lungs have to work a little bit harder, a little bit higher blood pressure to get um, blood to flow around the lungs. So that um, has knock-on effects to the rest of the system. So your blood pressure does slightly increase. So if you look at the trials, you'll see that although some people, the blood pressure went up a little bit, and an awful lot of people, the blood pressure came down. So overall, it's not a great improvement if you look at the whole population of people you gave CPAP to, but it does improve somewhat. And I'm going to add another layer of complexity to this because it's not as simple as that, particularly if you add on things like dipping status, uh, so if they're a dipper or a non-dipper or a riser, and also, interestingly, the heart rate as well, because that seems to make a difference. And remember, heart rate is, you get these flushes of adrenaline, which brings up your heart rate as well. So talking about that very mild group again, if you're a dipper, you're, you get normal drops in blood pressure at night, and you have a normal heart rate, and you give someone CPAP, uh, it tends to increase your blood pressure at night. So it may not be such a great idea for those people with very mild obstructive sleep apnea. So I don't think that, oh, look, um, uh, you, your AHI is nine, maybe 10 or something like that. And uh, your heart rate at night and your blood pressure at night is fine. Well, let's just try on CPAP anyway. Hopefully you'll feel a little bit better. I don't think it's a good idea. You should stick to the national guidelines and say, no, you have to be quite severe, 15 plus or so and very tired and, and also have problems with your blood pressure to warrant the need to have a CPAP device. Maybe try a mandibular advancement device, which doesn't raise your blood pressure at night or surgery doesn't raise your blood pressure at night, whereas CPAP would because it's that extra additional pressure. However, if you are a dipper, but with a slightly raised heart rate, you sort of feel like you're starting on this process with the the adrenaline's pumping through your system at night and it's starting to increase your blood pressure. In those situations, CPAP doesn't raise your blood pressure. It seems to just keep it as it is, um, which is better. It, it's not raising your blood pressure, but it does, it does seem to be making a slight difference. The other thing to point out is that if you're a non-dipper with a raised heart rate, that again doesn't improve with CPAP. So you look at it and go, oh yeah, my daytime um, blood pressure doesn't improve. But they go from a non-dipper, where their blood pressure doesn't drop at night, to a dipper. It starts dropping at night. So I think if you looked at their mean blood pressure throughout the day, morning and night, uh, day and night, you'll see that overall their blood pressure does drop. It's just it's not picked up if you do like a, a random daytime blood pressure check. So uh, if you did those trials, you'll see that on a 24-hour blood pressure check, it does actually reduce if you use CPAP. So in other words, they go from dippers, they go from non-dippers to dippers again. Um, and in the case of the people who have um, a low heart rate and they're non-dippers, or if they're risers, so their blood pressure goes up at night, if you give those people CPAP, they do really well. Their blood pressure comes down. They, they seem to feel an awful lot better, and it works very well for the, that population. And there are quite a lot of people in that population who don't even know they have obstructive sleep apnea. And so using CPAP on that population, particularly the non-dippers, the risers, and the people with a, a normal heart rate, weirdly, that's, that population seems to do very well. Now, that's not entirely true either. Another layer of complexity, just to annoy you further, um, because... Sometimes uh, if you're very severe, you're a non-dipper riser with a low heart rate, but you've got an awful lot of fluid on board because of the aldosterone and things like that in your system. That fluid makes it hard for the CPAP to work. So you're sort of fighting against your CPAP and that makes your blood pressure, doesn't change the blood pressure very much. So if you work with a really good cardiologist and someone who's really interested in uh, obstructive sleep, having blood pressure, things like that, it may be that you need to Use the CPAP to help you with your uh, obstructive sleep apnea and use some of these medications. And what you do is you pump a lot of this medication to drain the fluid from your system. So you use more than you would do normally. And so you try and get rid of all this fluid in a sort of uh, sort of an acute sort of way. Bring the fluid levels down. You keep using the CPAP. And so once all the fluid's out of your system, it releases some of the pressure in your upper airway. So, you could, so the CPAP works a bit better. You might need to go back to your CPAP settings and go, well, actually, you know, you, his obstructive sleep apnea has got slightly better because we've offloaded all this fluid now. So the CPAP settings need to be tweaked a little bit so it works better. 
And then you don't want to keep pumping them through with these uh, these medications to push their blood pressure down, or they'll lose all their fluid in the system. So you need to s- slow those down, even stop those uh, um, blood pressure tablets, the diuretics, the ones that make you pee a lot, and uh, spironolactone for the aldosterone side of things as well. So all those sorts of drugs need to be calmed down a little bit, and often you can stop them if you're if you've got to control of your obstructive sleep apnea with your CPAP. Um, I, I could have a big rant about how um, actually surgery doesn't cause any changes in your blood pressure, and that helps a bit. But actually, it's a lot safer using CPAP than doing surgery. And I guess that's for another uh, topic. But thank you ever very much for watching this thing. I hope you've noticed that it's, it is a really complex relationship, and I've tried to make it vaguely easy to understand with the layers of complexity. Uh, and there are other layers which I thought were too complicated. I'm only a surgeon. How do I? I don't know anything about blood pressure. But hopefully you understand the problems people face and why it looks like, oh, well, CPAP doesn't seem to work. I think it does work. But in you've got to cater it for the person in front of you. And that's why I'm blithering on about nothing. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.